actually. So So just uh, we'll hold on a minute. So, so there we are. We are going live actually. Yeah. Huh? So, uh, present uh, first uh, our first uh, uh, introduction will be Dr. K V S Hari Kumar. So can you pin Dr. K V S Hari Kumar to the top? Uh, <laughs> Okay, so uh, can you pin Dr. K V S Harikumar's uh, uh, to the top? I am just uh, uh, pinning him to the top so that you know we can all see our moderator. So he'll be the pilot of today's uh, uh, presentation. So um, he is. Uh, we are proud of him, and uh, he is uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, endo colleagues at Magna, and uh, he works at. Uh, 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 at uh, Magna Centers uh, Hyderabad, so and also in Fernandez Hyderabad, so he has got uh, a list of achievements. So uh, I mean, he's a renowned you know, endocrinologist. I think uh, people in Hyderabad know him very well, and of course, uh, he's well known in the endocrine community. So, but for people in Mysore and people in uh, um, uh, Bangalore, he needs an introduction. So uh, he has over two ten publications in peer reviewed. Uh, and PubMed index journals. So with a high H index and, uh, you know, he's in the editorial board of eight, eight journals. He's an accomplished uh, endocrinologist. So he'll be the uh, moderator for the session. I'll also take the opportunity to introduce the other uh, three brilliant uh, speakers. Next slide. Can you advance to the next slide, uh, Dilip? Yeah, our uh, first speaker will be Dr. Varun. Uh, he is a consultant endocrinologist at Magna Centers, Bengaluru. Uh, he has uh, just finished his uh, DM endocrinology from uh, Jipmer Pondicherry. So he is. We are co alumni actually. Myself, I am also from uh, Jipmer Pondicherry, and uh, he has ten publications in national, international journals and uh, two chapters in books. He is a rising star of endocrinology. So welcome, Dr. Varun. Next slide. Can we? Can you start your uh, video so that people can see you? And uh, we have with us uh, next speaker, Dr. Lakshmi Nagendra. Uh, she is a consultant endocrinologist at Magna Centers, Mysore. And she is uh, associate professor and head of the department, JSS Academy of Higher Education. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, uh, she, uh, she is one of the greatest, uh, you know, achievers in the last uh, two or three years in the sphere of uh, endocrine research having won the End Endocrinologist Par Excellence from RSSDI in 2023 and also the Endocrine Society of uh, India Yuvaratna Award. She's an award-winning endocrinologist, uh, uh, you know, recognized by others in the community. So, and she's also got the International Travel Grant of the Endocrine Society of India. So, uh, the research interest is uh, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, uh, and, um, you know, she's done several uh, meta-analysis and systematic reviews. Okay, so and uh, uh, next uh, next uh, speaker, please. So next is Dr. Pradvi. Dr. Pradvi is consultant endocrinologist and uh, he's affiliated with uh, Magna Centers, uh, uh, Film Nagar, Hyderabad. And also he's at uh, Arete Hospital, Gachiboli, Hyderabad. Uh, he has worked as uh, endocrinology faculty in the Nair Hospital, Mumbai. And uh, he has more than five, uh, you know, original index pub publication and co-authored two textbook chapters. He's co-investigated in multiple diabetes-related research products, uh, projects. Uh, welcome, Dr. Pradvi. So over to Dr. Um, uh, Dr. KVS uh, for uh, uh, for uh, the proceedings. Thank you, Dr. Anand, and uh, good evening to everybody. Greetings from the Magna Group, and uh, welcome you all to the, I would say, the first in the series which we are going to discuss the problem solving approach how i do it or how we do it we can have more interactions we can have more opinions anybody would want to uh, ask any question please post in the chat box or at the end of the session we can have a one to one interaction with whatever be the question in between if you feel like you can post in the chat box so that all of them will be addressed at the end of each talk we have three interesting talks lined up today. 
first by Dr. Varun, which is where I'm sure everybody would get a bunch of reports where uric acid is always bold in most of the patients, but we don't look at that and we don't maybe do anything to it. So Dr. Varun is going to tell us how to approach and what to do if you happen to see some reports like that and how to handle these cases. Uh, so a case of hyperuricemia, Dr. Varun. Thank you, sir. Uh, is my uh, screen visible now? And am I audible? Yeah, perfect. Just put it on the... Yeah, correct. Perfect. So, good evening all. Uh, welcome to the uh, monthly endocrine workshop. So, the first case scenario will be uh, common. Like we will be seeing on daily basis almost. So, a 30-year-old person with... Uh, serum uric acid of like 8.8 .8 milligram per deciliter. So before discussing uh, the clinical approach, like we will uh, just uh, refresh the pathophysiology of uh, uric acid metabolism and how we should define hyperuricemia. Then we'll go through the consequences of untreated hyperuricemia, then when and how we should uh, actually treat, treat or like how should we approach the patients with hyperuricemia. So Uric acid is the end product of uh, the purine metabolism, uh, the adenosine and guanosine. Uh, apart from that, even uh, it is uh, also a byproduct of like uh, the fructose metabolism also. So unlike the other mammals, uh, wherein uh, the other mammals contain uricase enzyme, wherein the uric acid is converted finally to more soluble allantoin. However, humans, uh, in humans, the uh, final end product of of uric acid metabol uh, uh, the purine metabolism is uric acid which is uh, not as soluble thereby uh, resulting in uh, different complications uh, from that so it's uh, the evolutionarily like uh, the uric acid is thought to be uh, able to slightly increase the blood pressure and it, it is supposed to be an advantage uh, in terms of when uh, the humans were uh, taking paleolithic diet which was very uh, containing very less sodium. However, over a period of time, when uh, the humans were on, uh, on a high sodium diet, uh, it has actually turned negative. So majority of the uh, uric acid comes from the uh, purine metabolism within the body. So only around 10 to 20% of the uh, uric acid comes from the diet, uh, exogenous uh, diet. So, and so the excretion part, uh, so, Majority of the excretion, 70% happens through the kidneys into the urine. Uh, around 30% uh, is through the gut. So how we should actually uh, define hyperuricemia? So for majority of the investigations uh, we see on a daily basis, the uh, normal uh, range uh, is based upon 95, uh, the 95% confidence interval. Unlike the uh, common uh, reference points, uh, the uh, uh, normal ranges, uh, when it comes to hyperuricemia, it is based upon physicochemical properties of the uric acid, wherein uh, so the uh, the common cutoff that is used is 6.8 or uh, 7 milligram per deciliter. And this is based upon the uh, saturation point of uh, uric acid into monosodium urate crystal in in vitro condition at 37 degrees. In, uh, in vivo conditions, uh, the crystallization happens actually at a lesser than a lesser uh, level than this at uh, around 6 milligram per deciliter. So how we estimate uric acid also has some bearing on the uh, cutoff. So the most common uh, method that, which is used like nowadays, uh, the uricase method uh, tends to give us 1 milligram per deciliter lesser. So if you get a report of uh, uric acid, which was done on a calorimetric method, we need to take a one milligram per deciliter uh, higher cutoff before defining uh, it as hyperuricemia. So the most common or like most uh, uh, important like clinical consequences are uh, gout. However, hyperuricemia uh, does not mean that like patient will be having gout only around uh, uh, 10 to 15 percent of the patients with hyperuricemia tend to have uh, got this data is from the uh, enhanced uh, uh, one like uh, data where wherein the prevalence of hyperuricemia was around 21 to like 26 uh, percent depending upon whether it is uh, population based study or hospitalized uh, patients however the got prevalence was less than four percent 
so we can see like majority of the patients with hyperuricemia they do not develop so so the development of gout uh, needs something else so although the uh, uric acid levels beyond uh, 6.8 or like uh, uh, 7 mg per deciliter uh, tends to form monosodium urate crystals not everyone uh, will uh, develop tophi uh, will uh, these crystals need to interact with the interact with the immune system trigger the uh, innate and like adaptive immune system and that inflammatory cascade will uh, result in damage to the uh, joints and can present as an acute uh, gout episode or chronic uh, goutaceous uh, tophi so in addition to the hyperuricemia these patients tend to have a genetic predisposition and additional uh, triggers like sudden uh, lowering of uh, the uric acid level or dehydration, etc. So we are not con con we are not uh, basically focusing on the patients who are developing gout. We are focusing on the majority of the patient, the other subset of uh, hyperuricemia patients, like eighty to ninety percent of patients, wherein they don't uh, have gout or any symptoms of gout. So will there be any clinical consequences uh, because of these asymptomatic hyperuricemia state or not? So definitely like these patients can develop uh, asymptomatic, they can be having uh, renal stones and sometimes they can present at some point with acute urate nephropathy and the hyperuricemia has been found to uh, be uh, associated or uh, to certain extent have some causative role in the development and progression of chronic kidney disease, not just the uh, chronic CKD, also the cardiometabolic syndrome, diabetes, hypertension, uh, the various components of metabolic syndrome and uh, cardiovascular disease. So first coming to the, uh, we will first see the like uh, the pathogenesis and like evidence behind each of these complications. So similar to GOT, uh, having hyperuricemia alone is not sufficient to cause uric acid stones. The uh, additional factors like uh, low pH, low uh, dehydrated state, like are needed to uh, predispose the patient to develop uric acid stones. And those patients who are having gout along with hyperuricemia, they tend to develop nephrolithiasis more commonly. And the role of isolated hyper hyperuricemia in the stone formation is uh, somewhat uh, less common. And like, uh, and the management of these patients is similar to other patients with urolithiasis, wherein we uh, ask the patients to be having like uh, adequate uh, fluid intake along with uh, dietary changes and conservatively uh, with uh, alkalinization of urine. So apart from the uh, renal stones risk, uh, these patients with asymptomatic hyperuricemia also are at higher risk uh, to develop the cardiometabolic syndrome with increased risk of uh, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and also the uh, chronic kidney disease. So the pathogenesis is uh, twofold. One, uh, these patients can develop uh, urate crystals which activate the immune system, uh, finally resulting in endothelial dysfunction and also damaging the tubular uh, interstitial uh, component resulting in increased uh, incidence of like, chronic kidney disease. And just uh, without any crystal formation also, the hy hyperuricemia leads to uh, impair the flow mediated vasodilatation and also damage the endothelium resulting in smooth muscle proliferation and uh, resulting from that hypertension, cardiovascular disease, etc. So there has been many observational studies which are uh, long-term uh, follow-up studies uh, of more than five years, uh, both in like North America European settings and also Japan, uh, Japan in Japanese population wherein it has been found that uh, there is a significant association between hyperuricemia and cardiometabolic uh, syndrome. Considering uh, that uh, these patients are at higher risk, so what are the options we have? Uh, first, uh, obviously, like uh, the non-pharmacological interventions, like uh, so restricting the animal protein, alcohol, and decreasing the fructose intake definitely will help uh, in these patients. In addition to that, uh, moderate intake of vitamin C, exercise, coffee, these are uh, found to be somewhat helpful. So uh, among the pharmacotherapy, apart from the urate lowering therapies, we also have the other drugs which are used for comorbidities in these patients with hyperuricemia like 
uh, patients uh, who if uh, somebody needs uh, any cholesterol lowering medications fibrous tend to lower the uric acid levels similarly losartan or the calcium channel blockers they tend to decrease uric acid among the oral hypoglycemic agents uh, hcld2 inhibitors actually the decrease in the uric acid levels is proposed as one of the pathophysiological mechanism for the uh, great cardiovascular protection uh, these drugs are having so then uh, if we decide to have the like uh, uh, one the like patient to be on urate lowering therapy, so the options that we have are xanthine oxidase inhibitors, which are allopurinol and febuxostat. Although we have rasburicase, we do not have peglotikase uh, in India. We have rasburicase, but it's used in situations like uh, tumor lysis syndrome, and it's given parenterally. So clinically, when it comes to uh, if somebody needs uh, the uh, urate lowering therapy, then we are left with allopurinol and febuxostat. Uh, in terms of adverse effect, allopurinol, uh, uh, it can have a significant uh, hypersensitive reactions in terms of uh, toxic abdominal necrolysis, Steven Johnson syndrome, apart from hepatotoxicity, etc. And with regard to febuxostat, the, these uh, hypersensitive reactions are somewhat less common. However, in uh, one of the trials, uh, case uh, published in NEGM 2018, it was found to have a slightly higher cardiovascular risk compared to the allopurinol. There was no control in that study, but the evidence is uh, in the uh, further like uh, published RCTs, we were not able to find such increased uh, cardiovascular risk. So how uh, we should approach uh, the, when should we treat and like how we, sh uh, we should treat. So there have been multiple guidelines with regard to the uh, management of hyperuricemia. The uh, there has been a Indian like group of experts uh, comprising of endocrinologists, rheumatologists, and uh, physicians, uh, wherein uh, the, the idea like uh, group. So all the patients with uh, hyperuricemia should uh, be advised regarding the non pharmacological therapies and. Uh, higher uric acid level, more than 9 milligram per deciliter, can increase significantly the risk for uh, various complications as we had discussed. And in those patients, a urate lowering therapy may be warranted. And in patients with uh, less than 9 milligram in the borderline range, around like 7 to 9 milligram per deciliter, urate lowering therapy may be considered in uh, patients, those who are having chronic kidney disease or uh, in early uh, stage CKD. Among the uh, CKD population also, uh, in various studies, uh, the subgroups uh, like early like stage 3 and like stage 4 CKD, younger population, those who are not having proteinuria, they, uh, the overall uh, EGFR progression or cardiovascular mortality benefits are more in that uh, cohort. So, Coming back to our patient, what should we do? So the patient's uric acid level was 8.8. So we should ask for uh, the joint symptoms or like any renal stone, uh, uh, any like uh, renal colic symptoms and imaging uh, should be guided accordingly. And for the secondary causes of hyperaricemia, like hemolytic anemia or myeloproliferative disorders, we sh definitely should look for a uh, complete blood picture along with peripheral smear and uh, liver enzymes for any uh, OTPT elevation. And also the uh, for uh, the serum creatinine and uh, estimated glomerular filtration rate. Then we need to uh, screen for the comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. So when sh uh, anyway, all of the, as we had discussed, all of these uh, patients with hyperuricemia should have uh, the non pharmacological intervention. And if they are having any comor comorbidities the medication should be optimized in such a way that the hyperuricemia can be like minimized. And uh, when should we uh, decide to have like uh, urate lowering therapy? Definitely, if the patient is having any episode of GOD, then we should definitely consider urate lowering therapy. Although not immediately when the patient is having acute GOD episode, at least after a few days or like once the GOD subsides. And the patient is having uh, either uric acid stones or early uh, CKD. Uh, the current evidence is more towards uh, treating these patients with hyperuricemia. When it comes to prevention of cardiovascular disease or if absolutely asymptomatic without any other indications, less than 9 milligram per deciliter, the uh, current evidence uh, 
is not in favor of treatment. So to summarize, uh, high uric acid levels are very, very common, almost like to the extent of 20 to 30 percent of general population. However, the gout, renal stones tends to occur in a minority of the patients with asymptomatic uh, hyperuricemia. So the we most will not have like any of these uh, indications for treatment. So they only need reassurance apart from uh, lifestyle modifications. In those who are requiring urate lowering therapy, it's important that we discuss the pros and cons of therapy. And even if we uh, want to go ahead uh, with uh, urate lowering therapy, suppose if somebody develops any, Steven, any of the uh, side effects, they are uh, very significant. So patients should be made aware of the uh, possible side effects. And especially uh, in future, this is a uh, big area of like research wherein in future, if you're uh, going to have a urate lowering therapy with good uh, significant like a cardiovascular benefit, we uh, will be like treating in future, like we'll be uh, shifting over to like those medicines, definitely. Thank you for patient listening. And I hand over the stage to uh, Dr. Harikuma. Thank you, Dr. Varun, for that excellent talk about how to address the patient with asymptomatic hyperuricemia. Uh, one quick question from my side. Since patient has no symptoms and you have an abnormal report, do we justify repeating a uric acid or we just go by one? What is the, uh, say, how good is the biochemical assay in identifying that? Do we have to repeat it or not? Uh, so if there has been recent alcohol intake, we can consider uh, the uh, dietary pattern, alcohol intake. So we consider these factors, like if uh, any of such factors are there, we can ask the patient to modify the diet and repeat uh, the uric acid level once more. Definitely. So if you have a confounding factor, you might as well repeat before taking a call. Fair enough. And uh, okay, two questions. Once initiated on urate lowering therapy, should they be continued lifelong? So we have to look at the uh, reason for like uh, the, what are the like possible contributing factors for the hyperuricemia. If uh, there is a prior uh, gout episode or in uh, patients with like uh, uh, genetic causes of hyperuricemia, they might be needing for a longer period of uh, urate lowering therapy. In patients with, uh, uh, and also like patients, uh, suppose if the indication is just, uh, the contributing factors are just the, lifestyle factors without uh, just uh, uh, uric, uric acid level of uh, 9 to 10 milligram per deciliter. In such scenarios, the uric acid uh, level might improve uh, with short duration of like urate lowering therapy. And at the time of initiation of uh, urate lowering therapy, sudden lowering of uric acid increases the uh, risk of acute gout. We also need to give a prophylaxis at that point of time. Yeah, that brings to the first question. Dr. Gita asked, what is the immediate treatment of acute gout? So, colchicine, steroids, NSAIDs, like uh, those will be the... Uh... Okay, so you should be careful about the precipitation of acute gout yeah. whenever you are rapidly lowering, perfectly fine. Relevance of LFT and how often to repeat in the setting of hyperuricemia. So relevance of LFT at the initial point of time, uh, like suppose if some, it can be hemolytic anemia also, like uh, that's one uh, possible like use of the LFT during the initiation. Uh, while on allopurinol or uh, febuxostat, we need not do for each patient, but definitely if some patient is having any of the symptoms, uh, it makes sense to uh, do LFT at that point of time. Even uh, how do you comment about, uh, say, metabolic syndrome, hyperuricemia, and NAFLD? Uh, it's a vicious cycle, definitely. Improvement in <laughs> metabolic syndrome is going to improve the other factors also. Rather than focusing just on hyperuricemia, we should actually be focusing on lifestyle modification in such patients. Okay. If NSAIDs are contraindicated, what should be given in the acute stage? Uh, colchicine and steroids uh, then in that case, definitely. Okay. And comment about peboxistat in patient with old CVA. 
So the uh, increased incidence of uh, the cardiovascular outcomes was only in that uh, case trial. After uh, that trial, there have been uh, multiple RCTs and uh, the incidence was not found. And in that case trial, the discontinuation rate was almost 45 to 50%. And there was no control group. It was only allopurinol versus febuxostat uh, combination. We are definitely like some caution is required. At the same time, the evidence is not so strong. Okay. Last, uh, how long to give treatment of acute and chronic gout if pain persists? So these uh, symptoms of acute gout will uh, definitely improve uh, over a few days to few weeks. So uh, that uh, and at the point of like if you are going to start urate lowering therapy at the end of a week or like two weeks definitely uh it's better to continue uh the uh prophylaxis like for a few days or few weeks until that point of time okay. thank you dr varun the questions are coming but i can say that since in view of paucity of time we will restrict and uh we're going to have more questions for the next talk i'm sure about it we have dr lakshmi with us who are going who is going to educate us about an unusual combination of very high dose of A1C insulin and high level of A1C. So how to handle this unusual combination? Over to Dr. Lakshmi. Please unmute yourself. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, good evening, everyone. Today, I'll be talking about a patient who is a known diabetic for 15 years, who's requiring about 100 units of insulin. And he's also uh, taking glimepiride and metformin with it, but has a HKVMC of 12. I'm sure many of us have come across these patients and wondering what to do. Is this a roadblock? Should we increase more insulin? Uh, should we give other OEDs? Uh, what to do? You know, even I have encountered so many of these patients uh, during my MD days. Uh, and, you know, uh, because diabetes is so common, I keep coming across these patients, uh, especially when they are referred to us uh, uh, because of this roadblock. So today we'll talk about causes of increased insulin requirement management. I'll uh, uh, share with you some of the cases that I've seen. And um, also we'll conclude about what could be the best uh, way to uh, you know, get over this roadblock. So when we talk about a definition of high insulin requirement, who actually is requiring high insulin? Patients who require more than one unit per kg per day or a total daily insulin uh, dose of more than 200 units can be uh, labeled as insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is a very common feature of type 2 diabetes. We know that, you know, it is one of the defining factors for type 2 diabetes. Um, but the degree of uh, insulin resistance is usually measured in the laboratory set, uh, settings using the euglycemic slam technique. But this is not very clinically useful. We don't do this in the clinic section. Uh, the, uh, you know, clinical pointers towards insulin resistance would be acanthosis nigrigans or skin tags or, you know, like our patient that I just uh, gave an example of uh, requiring a very high dose of insulin but still having HDMC over the roof. So, again, insulin resistance can be a pseudo-insulin resistance or it can be a true insulin resistance. Coming to this, when we look about, uh, when we look at true insulin resistance, there could be syndromes of severe insulin resistance, there could be medications. Again, this can cause the uh, insulin resistance. There could be endocrine disorders, um, anti-insulin antibodies, or even hysteria associated lipodystrophy, physiological causes, and again, pseudo resistance of, uh, for insulin resistance. When we speak about <coughs> endocrine disorders, acromegaly can cause a severe degree of insulin resistance, glucogonoma can cause, thyrotoxicosis can cause, Cushing syndrome can cause, pheophomous hyperbar syndrome. So just the bottom line is when you see a patient with uncontrolled diabetes requiring very high doses of insulin but still not controlled, you need to think about what is going wrong here. Rather than just increasing the insulin, we need to like you know take a step back and think that they could be uh, could there be an in the, uh, underlying endocrine disorder in this patient? Can something else be going on? So just to give you an example, this is patient one whom I just discussed. Uh, His insulin requirement was 100 units per day. His fasting plasma glucose, in spite of taking insulin, glimepiride, and metformin, was 246, and his A1C was 12. So when we looked at how actually he was taking insulin, he had a faulty technique of insulin injection. So actually, the insulin that he was taking is not getting delivered at all. So you can see the you know, lipodystrophy here because of repeated insulin injection. So he was taking repeated intracutaneous injections. Now we know that insulin uh, should be given 
subcutaneous, but he was taking intracutaneous injections of insulin and repeated injection at the same site. So he was not even uh, rotating the site. So you can see the site here is bad. Uh, his insulin is not getting delivered at all. And this is the cause for his sugar levels to be so high in spite of taking his insulin. So insulin is effectively not getting delivered to him at all. So when we talk about lipohypertrophy, so this is one, uh, you know, adverse thing that we can see with insulin therapy. This is accumulation of fat under the skin, partly caused by injecting too frequently in the same area. The patient goes on injecting in the same uh, area without changing the site. This could lead to lipohypertrophy. And in some uh, people, the lesions can be hard. So when you're seeing a patient who's on insulin, uh, you need to check uh, for his technique of insulin as well. So you can run your hands over the side that he's taking insulin and see if it is actually hard. Then you need to tell him to change the side because uh, delivering insulin at that very side may not be effective. There could also be lipotrophy. This is wasting of subcutaneous tissue. Uh, this is usually observed in countries where impure insulin is being used. It's slightly less common than lipotrophy. Uh, hypertrophy, but uh, you know, we still need to be on the lookout for this. So, when we look at the site, what site can you give insulin on? The figure on the left tells us the ideal site to administer insulin. It could be in the thighs, upper arms, abdomen, buttocks. Usually, what I see is upper arms, uh, you know, the patients are not really taught about how exactly to give insulin in the arm. So, most of them end up giving intramuscular. So, we should be very careful and teach them how to give a subcutaneous insulin in the arm as well. And also when we look at speed of absorption, when you give insulin, it's not the same speed of absorption at all the sites. So in the thighs, it is the slowest. Uh, it's also slow in the buttocks, but in the abdomen, it is fast and arms will be somewhere between the thighs and abdomen. The absorption can be medium to fast. So we also need to keep this in mind, uh, you know, when we look at the glucose profile of the patient. And rotation is very, very important. When we initiate on insulin, we should tell the patient that you should change the injection spot every day. And injecting in the same area can lead to lumpy fat nodules called lipodystrophy, like we see uh, for an, a patient or lipohypertrophy. And insulin absorption from lipodystrophy is erratic. Sometimes it can be too far, sometimes it can be slow, sometimes it may not get absorbed at all. So glucose control can suffer because of this. So this is the most important cause of patients being on insulin and the sugar is not being controlled. We should really check the site of patients. And we can advise them on rotation of sites like this. Like you can see in the figure, you can divide the abdomen quadrant into four parts and tell them that, you know, you take at one on one day, two on the second day, three on third day, and four on fourth day. This way they can rotate. They can even rotate sites in the thighs. They can rotate sites in the arms and even the buttocks. And so they should not be injecting at the same site every day. Now, that is the most common cause of, uh, you know, patients having a resistance to insulin. Now, uh, let me discuss another interesting case. This is patient two, 29-year-old female with history of type 2 diabetes is four years. She had a very poor control since one and a half years. Again, she was on more than 100 units of insulin. Uh, you know, she was also put on a basal insulin twice a day because uh, the control was just not good even with four times a day insulin. She was also started on liraglutide 1.8 milligram uh, because of her obesity. She was just, you know, she just kept on gaining weight. And she was also on metformin and she also had hypertension. She was on amylipin as well. So when we looked at her um, history, she had first uh, trimester abortion 10 months back, irregular cycles since then. Uh, she had a BMI of 34 kg per meter square. So when we look at this, we know that, you know, there is definitely something going on. A young patient with such, uh, you know, severe insulin resistance and also history of uh, abortion, irregular cycles, you should be definitely looking for the uh, features of Cushing syndrome in this patient. So that is what we did. And she had abdominal try and ecchymosis. And this was the patient, uh, you know, when before starting treatment. And this is not a weight loss ad, but this is, uh, you know, really what happened with the patient. As you can see, she lost a lot of weight when the cause was identified. So when she came, her fasting plasma glucose was 224, post-prandial glucose was 300, even to the 10.4. Uh, investigations for pushing for positive, her low dose sector, uh, methadone suppression test was unsuppressed, ACTS was high, MRI was done with order, pituitary microadenoma, uh, ACTS secreting pituitary microadenoma. So she underwent the uh, TNTS, uh, the tumor was removed, and uh, after the surgery, she lost a lot of weight, she conceived, her, uh, you know, anti-diabetic medications came down, so she was well controlled with just metformin one gram twice a day. 
and she also uh, Santi. So the moral of the story is diabetes is not just diabetes. Sometimes there can be an underlying disorder in diabetes. Again, going to the third case, this was a 40-year-old male referred again for uncontrolled diabetes. He had been having diabetes for three years and it had never been well controlled. He was also complaining of recurrent headaches, increased sweating, bilateral uh, knee pain. He was on and off on um, NSAIDs. He had history of erectile dysfunction as well. Again, he was on close to 100 units of insulin per day. He was also on 5 methadone and he was also advised to start Vogliboz because his uh, glucose control was poor in spite of being on high doses of insulin and uh, 5 methadone. Now, this is his uh, uh, picture. And here you can see that uh, this is uh, the doctor's hand and this is the patient's hand. So here you can see that there is a definite actual enlargement and he also gave history of actual enlargement. So his ring was not fitting him. He had to go up on his shoe size and uh, he had to actually remove his wedding ring because it was not fitting him. Now here the diagnosis is atromegaly. Uh, his fasting plasma glucose was 178, post glucose was 284, A1C again uncontrolled. IGF-1 was done. This is a screening test to look for acromegaly, and that was very high for his age. Uh, testosterone was on the lowest side. MRI cella was done. It showed here you can see that this is a pituitary macroadenoma. So this was a growth hormone secreting pituitary macroadenoma, which caused all of the symptoms in this patient. So again, not just diabetes, acromegaly leading to resistant hypertension sometimes in patients and resistant diabetes as well in the patients. And when you actually uh, remove the tumor and treat the uh, acromegaly, all of these symptoms come up. So when we look at other causes of insulin resistance, if the patient is on glucocorticoids, that can cause uh, you know glucose levels to be high, could lead to insulin resistance, atypical antipsychotics, calcineurin inhibitors, protease inhibitors, and even oral contraceptives can lead to insulin resistance. Now when we speak about pseudo resistance, what actually is pseudo resistance? Patient doesn't actually have insulin resistance, but there is a high requirement of insulin because of poor administration techniques, like we saw on the first patient, encourage storage of insulin, they're not storing insulin properly, I'll come to that, or malingering for secondary gifts. Now, I had a patient who was 40 years old, type 2 diabetes since 18 years of age, had a you know, very uh, significant family history. He was doing well, but uh, he had this worsening, sudden worsening of glycemic control since his last visit. So he was on regular insulin three times a day and blood being 38 units. His uh, fasting was 230 and post was 350. So this was sudden. You know, he was doing well for so many years and suddenly he came with these uncontrolled blood glucose levels. So then we looked at his storage and we got to know that he had actually moved houses and he was not storing insulin properly. He had, uh, you know, uh, shifted to a uh, uh, area with a higher temperature and he was not actually storing his insulin properly, which led to his uh, sudden worsening of uh, blood glucose. Now, this is very uh, important. Everybody is confused. Uh, right way to store insulin. Patients are always confused how to store insulin. So if the patient comes to you and asks you where exactly I should be storing my insulin, so there are two ways of doing it. The insulin that you're using right now, so the patient is using the uh, insulin, a uh, vial of insulin right now, this can be stored at room temperature. Right? If the room temperature is less than 30 degrees Celsius, you can store it at room temperature for about 28 degrees. But insulin products which are not in use, the patient has bought it and they're not currently using it, should be stored in the refrigerator between 2 to 8 degrees Celsius and this should be in the refrigerator door and not in the freezer. So two things, uh, insulin that you're using can be stored at room temperature less than 30 degrees for up to 28 days and insulin that you're not using should be stored in the insulin, uh, fridge but not in the refrigerator. So, uh, and also they should not be storing in the refrigerator because storage below uh, 0 degrees may cause the product being frozen causing cracking of vials and cartridges or displacement of the plungers and this will lead to incorrect delivery of insulin. Again, during transportation, this is a very common now question that I'm asked. What do I do? So the risk of freezing insulin products should be minimized and the, they should be stored in an insulated bag or cool thermoplast with ice at the ambient temperature. It's expected to be higher, usually higher than 30 degrees. So again, the insulin should not be kept in a locked car with closed windows. Uh, it's likely uh, to, uh, you know, be denatured and it cannot be used. And while traveling by air, uh, if you're traveling by flight, insulin should not be placed in the checked-in baggage 
to avoid exposure to extreme temperatures, mostly freezing. It should be in the hand bottle. So this is also very important to tell the patients that you should store insulin well. Now, when we look at pharmacological treatment in the setting of severe insulin resistance, not pseudo resistance, patients who are actually having severe insulin resistance, uh, we can be shifting to a concentrated, more concentrated forms of insulin like uh, U500 regular, U300 regular insulin, or GLP-1 receptor agonists have also been shown to be very effective. Mostly, they act on you know the weight; they bring down the weight, which reduces insulin resistance and can also actually lower the dose of insulin in some cases and of course metformin and CMP2 inhibitors have also been shown to be effective. Uh, Pioglitazone, yes, in uh, some cases, but uh, you know the um, most uh, uh, the um, contraindications to pioglitazone in some cases, uh, we cannot use it as widely as metformin. Uh, going to a summary, how do you actually approach a severely insulin resistant patient? The first thing was really to exclude a pseudo-insulin resistance. So in my practice, the most common uh, cause for this is incorrect insulin uh, technique or incorrect insulin storage. So once you have ruled that out, you should also be looking at the uh, conditions that we spoke about, like pushing or acronegaly, which could lead to this insulin resistance. This has been ruled out. Ask the patient whether the patient is on any drugs like glucocorticoids or antipsychotics, which can be causing this insulin resistance. And uh, once we have reviewed all this, if the patient actually has, uh, you know, insulin resistance because of his weight, then we should be starting in on drugs like the TLP1 analogs or SMP2 inhibitors to bring down this weight. And uh, if somebody is on TPN and or intranipid and this is causing insulin resistance, then can be considered switching to also in the forms of nut uh, nutrition or uh, considering holding for 24 hours and the severity of illness have uh, improved if, uh, you know, that is causing infection, high blood glucose causing infection uh, or uh, things like that in the IC. So that's the end of my presentation and I'd be happy to take them. Thank you, Dr. Lakshmi, for highlighting some of the interesting cases, number one. And actually more than the cases, it is the way to teach insulin or somebody to look at where they are injecting, what is the place, how that place looks like, all those things definitely could. But as a general rule, I would just like to say to the audience, if somebody is requiring more than one unit per kg per day, the normal conventional type 2, think beyond that there is something else is going in the system, that why this person is requiring so many units of insulin. Fair enough. So before... We have, as of now, no question. Okay. Uh, one of the interesting studies we did long back was about the diet and the insulin resistance. Some of them were heavy carbohydrate consumers, actually, who were, the moment you put focus on their diet and drastic reduction in their insulin requirement suddenly. And I'm sure you also would have seen, most of the times, whenever you start insulin, the patients behave like good boys or good girls and then start putting the diet into place and even a 10 unit would come into like hypos within no time from 300 they list drop down to 70s or 80s so maybe diet also which contributes significant amount to the insulin resistance or high insulin requirement storage issues change the vial change the pen all those things uh, one quick comment about your insulin syringes and vials the concentration wise yeah so there are 40 IU insulin and 40 IU syringe and 100 IU insulin and 100 IU syringe. So this is not very well known among patients uh, and uh, pharmacists as well. So I often find patients taking 100 IU insulin from 40 IU syringe or taking uh, 40 IU insulin from 100 IU syringe. So this can lead to the variation in the doses. So also I didn't include this, but also make sure that your patient is taking 40 IU insulin from 40, uh, you know, uh, for 40 IU syringe. And 100 IU insulin for 100 IU syringe. Otherwise, you know, it can lead to hypo or hypo. And also, uh, I mean, um, uh, this may sound ridiculous, but I have also seen a few patients injecting on their clothes. So if they actually don't know, you ask them to inject in front of you, you see that, you know, they're actually injecting on their clothes. So I have seen so many things with insulin injection. And I think in 90% of the cases where we're seeing this, uh, so-called insulin resistance. If you collect, uh, correct the technique, it uh, uh, you know it becomes organized. Correct. 
okay one question how long can you store in room temperature if temperature is higher than 30 so yeah so this uh, nobody knows but in india like you know uh, many of the people have studied this and uh, actually said that if you don't actually have a fridge you can make these pots store them with water and keep insulin in that even uh, that is effective uh, you know you the temperature even if the room temperature is more than 30 degrees you can actually make the ambient temperature of the uh, place that you're storing insulin uh, less than 30, or you could go for a fridge. So all the uh, factory fields tell us that you can store up to 28 degree, 28 day, uh, days for at 30 degrees. But, you know, in very hot uh, countries like, uh, you know, tropical countries, if your the ambient temperature is more than 30 degrees, the, it would be a better idea to have some form of cooling or, you know, to keep in the uh, fridge store even in such cases. Fair enough. Uh, what about pyoglitazone use? Yeah, so pyoglitazone has made a comeback now. And uh, the ADA says that it should be the first drug in patients who are having uh, a metabolic associated liver disease, MASLD or uh, uh, mass that we used to call it. Uh, pyoglitazone use also uh, reduces uh, true insulin resistance uh, to, uh, to some extent. Uh, yeah, and it has made a comeback. It was not much in work, but now it has made a comeback, especially in patients with uh, uh, metabolic associated fatty liver disease. Okay. We take out insulin from fridge and administer and keep it back. Is it okay? Yeah. So, uh, first thing that if, if your room temperature is less than 30 degrees, then you can keep it outside as well. I don't think, except in the summers in India, the room temperature goes about 30 degrees. So uh, the fridge is to store insulin that is not in use. If you uh, if you want to store the insulin that is uh, in use, that can be in the room temperature also. Can be in the room temperature. When to suspect or do anti-insulin antibodies in relation to severe insulin requirement? Yeah, so anti-insulin antibodies can also lead to hypoglycemia. So this is uh, where we read about it, the Hirata's disease, where anti-insulin antibodies can lead to erratic binding with insulin and then erratic, you know, uh, release of insulin, which can lead to hypoglycemia most often, but can also lead to hyperglycemia and severe insulin resistance. And this should be suspected in patients who have hypo, who have severe hypo, severe hypoglycemia. Or fluctuating control or more labile controls, all those people. Yeah. This last question, diabetic patients have tendency to develop higher risk of diabetic cardiomyopathy. Do they yeah, have they higher do. risk? They yes, do yes. Have. They do not only diabetic but, cardiomyopathy, but, uh, you know, an array of... Uh, yeah, uh, a whole host of cardiovascular issues are there with all diabetics. So that's why it is considered as a MI equivalent. Thank you, Dr. Lakshmi, and thank you all the panelists or the participants. We move to the last and more interesting talk young patient with diabetes we are not sure what are the etiologies the type 2 is growing type 1 is also growing and uh, dr prudvi is going to tell us about how to navigate this minefield of young onset diabetes over to dr prudvi yeah so Dr. Prithvi, you are not audible. Sir, am I audible now? Yeah, perfect. Yes, slides are visible. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. And my colleagues have discussed a very few important clinical scenarios and cases. Now I am going to discuss a case-based approach to a young onset diabetes, which is very much increasing in our clinical practice. So she is a uh, Miss X is a 20-year-old female. She presented with osmotic symptoms of polyuria, polydipsia, and loss of weight of 5 kg over the last 3 months. On history, her father is a diabetic and he was diagnosed in the late 50s. And on personal history, she is a typical millennial girl preferring uh, fast foods on a daily basis with sedentary lifestyle. On examination, she is little bit obese with BMI of, BMI of 26.03 kg per meter square and mild acanthosis is seen in this patient. 
she was admitted in private hospital with a random blood sugar of 450 mg per deciliter and she was found to have urine ketones 2 plus with bicarbonate of 15 mL equivalents per liter and she was labeled as mild dk and managed with iv fluids and insulin eventually after 3 days she was discharged on injection human mixed ad 25 units twice daily during her head admission her investigations revealed normal rft and lft with a hba1c of 13.2% ultrasound abdomen also revealed normal pancreas and they have sent for a type 1 diabetes auto antibody panel where the report is awaited and she came to my her parents brought her to my opd with a fasting blood sugar of 160 and a post prandial blood sugar of 209 and the anxious patient queries are like which type of diabetes it is this a diabetes is reversible does she need insulin for a life long can't we manage it with a medication to answer all these questions boldly and definitively i need Uh, we need to first discuss few more slides this is the american diabetic association classification of diabetes uh, we all know that autoimmune type 1 diabetes type 2 diabetes insulin resistant type 2 diabetes a diabetes in patient in, in young patient can be any kind of this diabetes whether it is type 1 type 2 monogenic diabetes or pancreatic diabetes or drug induced diabetes or secondary diabetes or gestational diabetes So this is how we were taught to differentiate the more common causes of diabetes in young. Type one diabetes usually age of onset is usually in the childhood or pre-pubertal. With the family history of diabetes is soon in around ten to fifteen percent of type one. Type one diabetes also, as with modernization, as with increasing the fat diets, the prevalence of obesity is increasing in our community, and the prevalence of obesity in type one diabetes is also increasing alarmingly. However, the markers of insulin resistance are unusual in type one diabetes, and then when their insulin auto antibodies and C-peptide levels are measured, they are usually positive. Insulin auto antibodies is seen, and along with low C-peptide values. In case of type two diabetes, usually the age of onset is usually post pubertal. Most of the time, they will be having a usually strong family history of diabetes in either of the parents, and they are usually more obese side. Uh, with signs of markers of insulin resistance like acanthosis skin tags and central obesity and on evaluation they tend to have normal or supra normal c peptide levels with negative islet cell auto uh, antibodies in case of monogenic diabetes usually they present before the age of 25 years and there is a strong family history of at least three generations on either mother side or family side of diabetes and the overweight and obesity as i said it is increasing in normal population and along with monogenic diabetes also markers of insulin resistance are usually absent in monogenic diabetes and c peptide levels are usually lower than normal and insulin auto antibodies are uh, islet cell auto antibodies are absent in monogenic diabetes coming to fibrocalcific pancreatic diabetes they have a typical history and they usually present in second or third decade they have a typical phenotype of lean phenotype with absence of obesity and insulin resistance markers and low c peptide and absence of auto pancreatic auto antibodies so this is the approach algorithm to diagnose a, classify the diabetes in the end if the patient young patient came with the diagnosis of diabetes first of all we have to look at the family history of diabetes if it is positive if it is there for three generations or not then we have to consider their ketonuria history of ketonuria present or absent they have a very uh, good beta cell reserve we can check by checking their c peptide value either mixed meal stimulated and if there is family history of diabetes present in three generations and there is no ketonuria and good beta cell reserve then we can label them as monogenic diabetes and for the subtype classification we can do the genetic testing if there is a family history of diabetes in only one generation either in the father or mother with no ketonuria and with good beta cell reserve of normal or supra normal c peptide levels then we can label them as early onset type 2 diabetes and we can manage it accordingly if the there is no history of family history of diabetes and if there is a ketonuria present it is usually type 1 diabetes and we have to manage them with the insulin if there is no family history of diabetes and there is no ketonuria also and if there is any history of steatorrhea or chronic pain of the abdomen or pancreatitis it is advisable to uh, confirm the pancreatic calculi either with imaging uh, x ray or ct scan abdomen for the diagnosis of fibrocalcific pancreatic diabetes and rarely very rarely uh, we can see the acromegaly and cushing's other endocrine disorders presenting as a diabetes in the end so what does the data say this is the icmr youth diabetes registry 
they considered youth diabetes as diabetes in patients less than 25 years of age. This is the data till 2011, and they got published as a phase one in the 2016. In this data, they recruited around 5,546 patients of young diabetes less than 25 years old. And in this data, around 63.91% population are type 1 diabetes, and 25.3% are type 2 diabetic, and 3.1% of the population are monogenic diabetes, and 3.9% of population are gestational diabetes. And other diabetes compromise uh, less than 1%. Uh, individually. And this executive summary of youth diabetes registry also presents the most common symptom of mode of presentation for type 1 diabetes. Uh, as you can see here, the most common presentation of type 1 diabetes is osmotic symptoms and weight loss. It is seen in around 28.8%, whereas ketosis is the second most common side of uh, common mode of presentation in type 1 diabetes, and it is seen in 25.2% of the patients. When come to uh, type 2 diabetes, the most common presentation is in asymptomatic. The incidental finding of abnormal blood sugars on a routine medical checkup, around 33%, that is one third of the patients are incidentally detected to have abnormal blood sugars found to be type 2 diabetic. And uh, the other common presentations are only osmotic symptoms like polyuria, polydipsia. Uh, and the other common presentation is isolated weight loss without any osmotic symptoms. As, as expected, the mean BMI values of type 2 diabetes are more in type 2, uh, type 2 diabe diabetes children and young adults than the type 1 diabetes. As we can see, the signs of insulin resistance like acanthosis is usually we associate it with type 2 diabetes as it is seen in but only 18.8% of the young diabetes type 2 diabetes patients and it is also seen in 4.1% of the type 1 diabetes. So we cannot definitively say that classify the diabetes based on the presence or absence of acanthosis and aggregates. This is what I want to highlight. And the urine ketones also same. Around 32.7% of the young patients who are type 1 diabetic have ketones. And again, 6% of the type 2 young type 2 diabetic patients also have keto history of ketonuria. Again, ketonuria, presence of ketonuria, may not be a definitive factor to classify the young onset diabetes. So if, I, if we want to classify a diabetes in a young patient, these are the parameters we usually look at. The ketosis, fam, history of ketosis, family history of diabetes, markers of insulin resistance, uh, history of pancreatitis or steatoria, or if autoantibodies and C-peptide values are available, we can definitively say the classify the diabetes. The presence of ketosis and autoantibodies favor the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, whereas presence of insulin resistance signs, family history of diabetes, and absence of keto ketosis and autoantibodies and pancreatitis favors the type 2 diabetes. Whenever there is an, nowadays we are most commonly seeing, uh, seeing the patient presenting overlap manifestations, that is some manifestations of type 1 diabetes and some manifestations of type 2 diabetes in those patients autoantibodies, C-peptide testing, and genetic testing will help us in uh, classifying our diabetes boldly. Coming back to our patient, our patient has a history of ketosis, which is more favoring towards the type 1 diabetes. And she's also, her father is also at diabetes, which is more favoring type 2 diabetes. She is a little bit obese and you know, mild acanthosis is there. So it is also again favoring type 2 diabetes. So can I say this patient has a type 2 diabetic boldly? No, that's what I was, uh, the youth diabetes registry data I have shown. Meanwhile, her autoantibodies came positive, GAT65 came positive for her. So she was labeled as type 1 diabetes and her basal bolus insulin was continued uh, to maintain her smooth glycemic control. So what does the guidelines and recommendations that what publication published in the last year Diabetic test care journal say about usage of autoantibodies to classify diabetes. They recommend to use standardized islet autoantibody test from the standardized laboratory for classification diabetes in whom there is a phenotypic overlap between type 1 and type 2 diabetes, which we are more commonly seeing nowadays and with uncertain type of diabetes. And these clinical presentations may warrant measurement of autoantibodies like if they hang on to diabetes presenting with catabolic presentation uh, with weight loss and ketonuria or having a lean body habitus with no features of metabolic syndrome or if they have any personal history of autoimmune disease or strong family history of autoimmune disease, including type 1 diabetes or adolescents or young adults with overweight obesity who present with apparent type 2 diabetes may have type 1 diabetes that has not yet progressed to 
insulin deficiency phase that is honeymoon phase so we have to judiciously use our lab parameters like autoantibodies and c-peptide testing before classifying our young patients uh, uh, young diabetic patients so the management of the type 1 diabetes and the pancreatic diabetes is insulin insulin and insulin only uh, briefly i am going to discuss about the management of early onset type 2 diabetes we are seeing more 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 and more cases in the uh, nowadays in our clinical practice if there is a genetic predisposition that is family history and these millennials are tend to have all these risk factors like unhealthy and erratic food habits with erratic sleeping behavior with physical inactivity or lack of exercise or stress secondary to chronic illness or psychogenic illness stress all these factors can contribute to early onset presentation of the type 2 diabetes so we need even when we start to treat these patients we have to address all these cons all these issues also individually along with the medication coming to medication part of the while the principles of treatment for the early onset type 2 diabetes is strict glycemic control in the initial one year phase of the uh, diagnosis of diabetes to prevent the microvascular and macrovascular complications at the later stage and to increase the chance of a diabetes remission so conservation of islet shell should be given priority in these patients by uh, judiciously using the insulin secrete of gags uh, at the third line or fourth line instead of as the first line or second line if the patient present with a mild hyperglycemia of 6.5 to 7.5% we can use we'll start with a lifestyle modification plus metformin and we can gradually step up the uh, oral antibiotic drugs targeting their fasting blood sugar postprandial blood sugar and hba1c if they have a very high hba1c at presentation that is more than 9% we have to initially hit them hard with either two or three points plus or minus basal insulin or basal bolus insulin and once we achieve normal glycemia we have to gradually down titrate the insulin and the oids our target is to maintain the normal glycemia low glycemia with minimal amount of medications uh, as possible so i would like to conclude uh, my case with uh, my discussion with uh, imposing these two points that is using age of onset and phenotypic manifestations to classify in diabetic diabetes in young is is not reliable completely whenever in doubt use judicial judicious laboratory parameters like pancreatic auto antibodies and c peptide testing in early onset type 2 diabetes strict glycemic control in the initial one year of diagnosis is very important to prevent the complications and increase the chances of remission i am ready to take answer any questions thank you dr pradeep for the excellent overview of the confusions concerning the management or maybe even diagnosing the diabetes one comment i would like to say here it is no crime even if you are not able to label a child either a type 1 or type 2 at the first instance the idea is just control the hyperglycemia the diagnosis is important there is no doubt about it but it can wait because lot of times there is so much of overlap between these that a single parameter single test may not lead you and unnecessarily you need not panic the child that we don't know what is happening you treat and you can always have as he has rightly shown the approach you can take care about diagnosing and labeling at a later uh, <clears throat> c peptide levels influence of exogenous insulin and influence of glucotoxicity yeah when to do c peptide that's what uh, whenever patient is in glucotoxicity the c-peptide can come falsely slow so we do not usually order those tests whenever we want to do a c-peptide testing there is a certain criteria first of all the patient should have a euglycemia and usually we use intermediate acting insulin the previous night only 80% of the dose and uh, in the fasting state when the fasting blood sugar corresponding blood sugar is used along with the fasting c-peptide and mixed meal is given or glucagon is even given and after one hour again we check the c peptide levels along with the corresponding blood sugar if the corresponding blood sugar rose more than 180 we think it as a stimulated c peptide and if it is more than 1.8 or 2.1 nanogram per ml we think is an fs sufficient beta cell reserve uh, for that patient so to do the c peptide first of all patient need to have a normal glycemia for the last two weeks at least and the insulin sheet needs to be the previous night insulin needs to be reduced and intermediate acting insulin needs to be used more than a long acting insulin 
and please don't do any random c peptides it conveys no meaning to anybody so whenever patient walks into opd just don't please pick up a c peptide to see what is going to happen can young diabetic be at risk of pancreatitis in future diabetes itself cannot be a risk factor the pancreatitis but pancreatitis is again a common disorder and the diabetes is a common disorder the prevalence of having both diabetes and pancreatitis can be seen increasing in nowadays actually but as a diabetes it is a risk factor for pancreatitis i don't think so maybe obesity and gallstones may be increase alcoholism may be a increased risk for pancreatitis but as a diabetes i don't i'm not sure yeah the diabetic do have a twice increased risk for having a pancreatitis definitely that's why actually when the gliptin controversy and all came about increasing the risk of pancreatitis it was attributed even to the sake of that diabetics themselves are more i mean more prone so why blame the gliptins but uh, till the time that butler data and pancreatic ductal hyperplasia all those things came in that is the time when they started looking at more closely they do have slightly increased risk but Uh, same goes with young diabetic or a old diabetic as well say anything but more important than that is to look at the pancreatic imaging in all patients especially with young diabetes to look at any of those secondary diabetes or atrophic pancreas all those things are important to be picked up okay influence of exogenous insulin you already discussed okay no more questions as of now i think by and large the approach has been clear uh, thanks dr prudhi dr varun and dr lakshmi for the excellent overview of interesting cases and thanks to all the participants for i would say more interesting questions uh, before i conclude i can say that as i said this is going to be ongoing so in case if you feel that a particular topic needs to be discussed you can reach out to any one of us who will take up during next sessions that this clinical problem will be addressed or should be addressed as the way it wants so it is like uh, more of interactive more of uh, education more of learning both ways is what we are looking at through this media wherever clinical problem is being faced in whatever forms uh, which we can all discuss together and possibly find a solution and ultimately it will improve some patient in the long run so that is what is our aim and <clears throat> before i close i thank all of you and uh, thanks to dr anand who put his heart and soul and time and everything behind this dr anand and his team last words from dr anand santosh to speak santosh will give the word of thanks so yes so i i would like to extend the words of uh, dr hari kumar so dr anand raman and the team from bangalore have done an excellent job in bringing this program uh, together and we hope to continue this program every month so uh, as uh, dr anand raman would have already told magna centers for obesity diabetes and endocrinology is right now in its uh, 12th year running we started in 2012 Uh, we started as a single center based based out of hyderabad we followed quickly by bangalore chennai and now we are happy to say that we are having eight such center eight centers and we have nine endocrinologists at the moment in our, our group and uh, you would have guessed by now that all the endocrinologists who are in 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 our uh, fray are all academically oriented and uh, this can be uh, especially stressed by the fact that this is our 28th academic activity that we are actually doing where we are reaching out to multiple doctors in various cities uh, and uh, i think there is there is a small uh, video for, for around 1 minute which i would uh, ask ajit to play right now and then i'll propose the vote of thanks
So just to wrap up our meeting, I would like to extend a lot of gratitude to all the people who have attended this particular meeting right now live and all the people who are going to watch this, who are watching this in YouTube as we are speaking right now. And uh, yes, if there are any specific topics that you would like to be covered, you can reach out to us or you can leave the comments on our YouTube video saying that we would like so-and-so topics to be covered by our uh, esteemed team of endocrinologists. So for tonight, thank you. Have a great night and see you next month. Thank you all. And thank you, Dr. Anantraman and Magna. Excellent initiative. Thank you. Thank Looking you, forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pete. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>